Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. My name is Quinn Jacobson, and this is what we call, or I call, the Studio Q Show Live. You may not be watching it live, but some of you are. And uh, as we let the YouTube people join in, here we go. They're notified now. They'll jump on in. It's good to see everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Hope everybody's well, feeling good. Um, we're still... Uh, we're still battling things up here. Obviously, I'm not in my home, uh, but we're working on that. Um, and uh, soon, hopefully, hopefully we will be. We'll see what happens. And, you know, it's weird. I live in a very rural area in the state of Colorado in America, western Western U.S., Colorado. Tiny little what we call counties, Providence, or, you know, whatever. We call them counties. And there's only one particular inspector for this job that I can get into my house after that inspection's done. And uh, his wife died. And so he's out. So every, uh, all my stuff is on hold. So hello, Will. Hello uh, from Erie PA. Good to see you, Paul and Posse. Yes. Yes. We're always a posse this way. So I think we got some good stuff for you to see today. I went ahead and did a little something different. Um, I have. Uh, um, I like to look at these 19th century manuals and and try to turn you guys on and gals, guys and gals, men and women, try to turn you guys guys and gals on to the good stuff. And I think I've got a good one for you today. It's a 514 page manual. It's called the Manual of Photography by the Alfred Brothers in 1892. And I've talked a lot about in the past how I like these older manuals because. Obviously, time teaches us a lot. Experience teaches us a lot. Um, they were very raw coming out of the shoot in the 1850s and 60s even. Not saying there are not good manuals. Definitely in the eight, late 1850s and, and 1860s, there are a couple of good ones. But this is where I find those earlier manuals is where I find problems. Um, uh, it's, and it's interesting to, to find those. But today we're going to do, uh, do something interesting. Hola, Pablo. Good to see you, brother. Uh, we're going to do something inter interesting, I hope. And also, other than the technical reading on the manual, um, that you'll definitely learn something because I learned something from reading this. Every time I get into one of these manuals and read it, I learn something, something new, something that, wow, I didn't know people did that, but yes, they did. And there's Thilo. Hello from Japan, Thilo and Linda. Good to see everybody. Yeah, that's awesome. I love the regulars coming in here. I know we preach to the choir, right? But there are a lot of people on YouTube that watch these. So uh, they're good. And 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 it gives the um, soundboard to have some regulars in here. So anyway, let's uh, open up this. I'm going to screen share. And we'll jump right on in here and do this thing. So we're going to start off. Let me see. Make sure all this is up to snuff here. Yeah, it is. Um, we're going to start off. Um, I was trying to think of a good catchphrase this morning. I can't think of a good catchphrase. It's the Studio Q Show Live. Um, so we're going to start off with this. Uh, am I in there? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to start off with saying what we're going to do today. So reading from the Alfred Brothers book, I think you'll enjoy that. I hope you will. And uh, stop me if you have questions, although you can, we're going to have a Q&A in here as well too. Then we're going to look at, uh, review some of Lewis's Carroll's uh, portrait work. Um, and I'm sure, I hope everyone is very familiar with Alice in Wonderland. Uh, he's the author of that. But actually, he was quite a prolific wet collodion artist. And we're going to look at some of his work out of, uh, it's called Victorian something. We'll look at it. Uh, and they they review uh, Julia Margaret Cam Cameron's work, uh, Rylander's work, and another one, and uh, Carol's work. And we'll look at some of that. I, I just want to, I want to open you up to uh, a little more of this Victorian Portraiture work is kind of interesting to me, and, and I'll explain it as we go through. But look at some of his work and talk a little bit about him. And uh, 
Hank sent me some email. We'll look at Hank's email here um, and maybe answer a couple of questions from email as well, too. And then questions and answer. And then I'm going to do some recommended reading here. Um, we'll talk about that when we get there. <clears throat> so the Alfred Brothers, the Manual of Photography, 1892. Again, it's important when you're looking at this material to pay attention to who, who's writing it, when it was published. And then as you go through the literature, if you can kind of um, uh, make notes, comparing notes. And I have all of these books downloaded um, and, and printed out. Most of them are printed out. I actually have them printed out. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to jump in here and take a look at this one. This is out of, of course, London. And you see there, 1892. Um, <laughs> it's actually called Photography. It's History, Processes, Apparatus, and Materials. But when you get into the book, it's called the Manual of Photography. So we'll we'll, uh, we'll stay forget about the semantics, um, and we'll go we'll jump right into it. I got to pull this up in PDF, and hopefully we have um, PDFs up here. Yeah, I hope I can show my PDF through here. Yeah, I can. Where is it at? Application. There we go. All right. So. I've highlighted a couple of things in here. Obviously, we're going to talk about, and again, the book is 541 pages. So it is comprehensive. I mean, it is absolute, and it's got a nice uh, weights and measurements in the back. A lot of them do. This is quite exhaustive. So if you uh, go to uh, Google Books again, just uh, type in Alfred Brothers and uh, you'll find this book and you can download it. You're going to find this very helpful. I, I know you will because there's a couple of bits in here that even kind of blew my mind. So let's jump into it. Let's talk about this. Hello, Shasha. Sasha. <laughs> Sasha. Good to see you, brother. Guten Abend or Guten Tag, whatever time. I guess it's Guten Abend. Yeah. Um, so let's do this. I'm going to actually read this. Uh, not all of it. I'll stop. We'll talk about it. But I want to talk about uh, the big ones that he drops, some of the kind of the bombs he drops in here as far as the process goes. So he's going to talk about negatives here, but there's a lot. And he'll go into, he'll go into the uh, positives here in a minute. But a lot of this stuff is really uh, cross-pollinates the variants, positives and negatives. You can just really get a uh, a good sense of of what he's doing here. So let's go ahead and read this. Collodion, of course, the wet collodion because is dry collodion, of course. So of all the photographic processes, no results, if we accept the daguerreotype, have ever surpassed those produced on plates prepared by the wet collodion method. That's quite a statement right there. And although the introduction of dry plates prepared with a collodion or gelatin emulsion and in various other ways may be said to have taken the place of the older process for certain purposes, the wet collodion has not been superseded and probably it may never be entirely. That's another interesting kind of comment there. He's talking about the quality of the, the wet collodion negative and positive, negative in this case, but he'll, he'll talk about this uh, uh, positives down here. So let's just jump right into the technical portion of this. Uh, he goes through the entire process just in paragraph after paragraph, so we have to kind of pick through this. Um, I found it interesting. This paragraph starts out with the glass used, excepting for any special purpose, need not be patent plate. You've got to remember in the 19th century, a small piece of clear glass was very, very expensive. I've talked about it before, but they used to do on positive sides, they used to take the, say it was a half plate, they'd make the image, then they'd float the image off the glass and put it on black leather because leather was a lot less expensive than the plate and they could reuse the plate. So the glass was very expensive. The best flatted crown or sheet glass, not too thin, answers every purpose, both positive and negative. The glass must be perfectly clean. Now listen to this. Rouge, whitening, or fine triply Rouge is coming out of the daguerreotype era. The whitening, which we use, uh, is the counter that at least I use and I recommend using. Alcohol and distilled water or
he lost connections in the mountains. How's everybody else doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Quarantine, quarantine. <laughs> Home every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only shop for food. Lots of time to make plates. <laughs> yes. And uh, start with uh, carbon print, I think. Now we, can talk. now we can talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Wait for win. But I think a carbon print is much more difficult than wet plate. Yes. Yes. And that I like. A big <laughs> challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a workshop with Quinn a few years ago, and I tried to do it on my own, and still haven't succeeded. Okay. Really? Yeah. Tough. I live in Norway, so uh, long way, long distance to go to workshop. So uh, <laughs> I must, I must do everything on my own. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's good we have so many things on the internet today. YouTube and other places. It's, uh, Very true. It's, yes, it's only a matter of tr uh, time and trying and trying and trying. Read, read, try. But yeah, so, your white plate work is uh, stunning. I like your images so much. Yes. So uh, one year and three months. In the wet one year and three months. That's uh, unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, nice perfect. Nice pictures, uh, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yes, uh, the, the, the technique about uh, wet plate, the cleanness of everything, I have control on now. So now is to make more uh, creative photos. Because uh, you're not uh, burning down of the technical press process it you can make later better photos because then you think more about lightning to, uh, more, more about detail and uh, motive and uh, yeah so because in the beginning you are very stressing to to uh, to get uh, the right exposure clean or plate yes but today i feel i have control so but i think that's uh, i make all my chemistry Chemistry and uh, everything clean. Procedure for everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. Good start point. What kind of light do you use for your portraits? I like your portraits very much. Uh, it's uh, I used before uh, two uh, only two brown color. Fifteen uh -huh. uh, fifteen hundred watt with a very long reflector, seventy five mm -hmm. degrees. So it's throwing the light. Yeah. Yes. But uh, now I buy me an uh, old uh, Bowen 6000 watt. Six. Yes. That's because I shall have a model shoe uh, in the studio room with on a bed. So I have more, have more light for uh, two, three meters mm -hmm. for a whole model laying in the bed. bed and, uh, yes, I have a. I'm just waiting for Corona going a little down so I can take Moodle in house again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's back. Oh, yes. All right, <clears throat> let's see if we can do this. Um, I may not be able to run this uh, new PDF, this Acrobat on this machine. I don't know, I froze up somewhere along the line. So, uh, what can we do? Anyone know how you remove the image on glass to leather as Quinn was talking about very, yes, Linda, I do. It's really quite simple. Um, without even trying, most people, if they make images on a glass plate, they'll get what I call fish gills on the edge of the plate. They'll start flapping up. And once you see those fish gills on any corner of the plate, that plate is gonna be gone. You're not gonna be able, be able to save that unless you've ha you have it washed and then you take it out quickly dry it over a heat lamp and varnish those edges down because they will they'll continue to cur curl up if you if you do that but 
if you want to take the image off glass, and I've shown a couple of these in the past. I used to have a big wine bottle in my studio that every every plate, every uh, lift or peeling on glass plates, I'd take it off. I'd take um, chopsticks, take it out of the water, and lay it onto the onto the green bottle. And I made this portraiture. It was really beautiful. I wish I would have kept it. A really beautiful portrait. Uh, big wine, you know, three, four liter wine jug with these portraits stuck all over it and they were sealed down. I also did it with a white vase. Uh, and there's a couple of photos of this somewhere online of lifting plates up and putting them on the vase. How you have to do that is that if you purposely want to lift the plate off, off, off the glass, what you'll want to do is make the plate, let it dry, then put it in a pan or a tray of warm water and that warm water will get under there and lift it off and you can encourage it it may take two or three four minutes but that'll lift right off and then i recommend and they're really difficult because they're just, it's colloding it's just gonna just gonna wisp up and, and go into a tiny little piece of, of material so if you want to keep it spread open you need to use chopsticks get under both ends let it float up on the on the water, get under both ends and lift it off and then have something you can put it onto. The black leather, leather types as they were called, um, were very, um, very popular because they were inexpensive. And uh, yes, uh, not like the Polaroid. Yeah, kind of like the Polaroid transfer. Uh, yeah, don't use gel, <laughs> don't use albumin on the edges. No, you won't, you'll end up taking a razor blade and cutting around the edges to get the plate to lift, lift off. But you don't have to use anything. Most people are going to have a problem with glass adhere or clothing adhering to glass anyway. So this is in a this is in a very far stretch um, to say you can lift that off and do it. I've done it a lot, just mostly with plates that I have the little fish gill on, and I know they're going to go. I grab my chopsticks and I have something around that I can lay the image on, especially if it's a decent image, right? Um, they are beautiful on leather. They're beautiful on glass. They're beautiful on dimensional objects, like I said, a wine jug. So now you can start putting um, images on pretty much anything you want. This would happen to be a dark uh, green wine jug that really, really lit up well. I thought it would be really cool. Check this idea. This was years ago. I thought it'd be really cool to do a whole series of portraits relating to something with the object of a bottle of some kind of industry or profession or some attachment that people would have with that shape or type of bottle um, and do portraits of them and put their portraits all over these objects. And then in the bottle, lower it down a 5,600 daylight LED light and illuminate it from the inside and just have little pieces of, of that kind of, you kind of transcend photography in that sense. You know, you kind of go beyond uh, just the photographic, turn, turning things into objects, uh, kind of interesting. Look, this wet colloding process, as you all know, is limitless. A person could spend their entire lifetime just on one of the variants, positive or negatives. And if you get into negatives and you start running down those rabbit holes, no pun intended, um, Alice in Wonderland, if you start running down those rabbit holes, you will run into all kinds of stuff you can do with this process. So yes, a beautiful, a beautiful way to deal with things. Um, yeah, try it out. Um, it's 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 nothing, uh, elab uh, ex uh, nothing difficult or, or expensive or elaborate to do at all. Um, just find something. The most difficult part is getting that piece of collodion intact out of the water and then onto to something. Um, I don't know if I dare open this Alfred book up. I may have to push that to next week, and I'll do screenshots of what I want because I think I'll freeze up again. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm, I know my, my, my slideshow works. So I'm going to jump over to the slideshow again, and we'll just go through a couple of, uh, couple of other items that we can deal with here. Great book, though. I mean, just a great book. Uh, I'll, I'll do it next week. Um, let's, let's jump into Lewis Carroll and the Victorian Giants, the birth of art photography. Right off the bat, I would love to hear um, what you guys think about that commentary. This is from the London Gallery, uh, Portrait Gallery. I think I'll, we'll, we'll look. Um, 
This is a very interesting title for a book, Victorian Giants, but the subtitle, The Birth of Art Photography. So are they implying that um, there was no art photography before, um, you know, all of these people work in wet collodion? Are they implying that daguerreotype was com completely commercial or, um, you know, there's, there, there, what are they implying here? The birth of art photography. Okay. I am not going to argue at all with that premise uh, that it's art photography. I think Julia Margaret Cameron, her motives and intent were purely based in, in uh, self-expression. The idea, she wasn't doing it for commercial purposes, right? She'd have, she was, she didn't even start in photography until she was almost 50 years old. Wealthy, well-connected. People had come over to have dinner, lunch, and, you know, Lord Tennyson, and she'd take them out to the studio and make photographs of them. And it was purely based on her expression, this kind of uh, soft pictorialist look. That's Julia Margaret Cameron. But an Oscar Rylander. Rylander is buried, uh, interestingly enough, if you know his work, and you should if you're in Wet Collodion, Oscar Rylander is buried not too far from Fred Frederick Scott Archer. Um, he's in uh, Kensal Green there. They asked me to be involved in that one, and I politely passed. I said, I, I, I've, I've had my fill of uh, headstones and, and plaques on graves, but I appreciate that. Yes, uh, Thilo, I love Rylander's photos as well, probably uh, more than Archer's, actually, to be honest with you. So nothing against Rylander. I would have loved to have done that, but it was not a good time in my life to be involved in that again. So um, anyway. We want to talk about Lewis Carroll, and we all know Alice in Wonderland, um, that, you know, that kind of high uh, fantasy, um, you know, people can, can critique this story itself all you want. But Lewis Carroll was mainly known for children's books. And what I'd like to show you here is a couple of, uh, a couple of, uh, images and we're going to jump out of this but um just these two we'll talk about this gentleman in a little bit but could anybody recognize this image on the left here the young lady there anybody recognize that image it's a lewis carroll image um that her name is alice little he photographed her she's the inspiration for alice in wonderland so he photographed her this was the only uh, image of her after the book was published. We'll look at a couple of when she was younger, but he had, he definitely had a, uh, uh, man, he, he, his portraiture work is impressive to me. I like uh, the style. I like what he's included. I like, we'll, we'll talk about all this. I like how he's handled his subject matter and what it is and why it is kind of thing. Um, I'm going to have to jump over here. Sorry to do this again, but I'm going to stop sharing there. I'm going to jump over and go to a website so you guys can look at this stuff on your own when you want to. I'm going to jump over here to a website that's great, uh, and maybe we'll we'll look at uh, we'll look at um, Julia Margaret Cameron's work next week. But um, so Lewis Carroll was born in 1832, and he died in 1898. Um, uh, let's just jump over here and take a look at this. Share screen, uh, boom. I'll give you the URL for this as well too. Art Blart. So here's Art Blart. Um, and what we're, what we're looking at here, or going to look at, um, so the, the photographic process that we know as wet collodion was released in March of 1851 in a, in a little volume uh, called The Chemist. Frederick Scott Archer released the recipe in 1851. In 1856, Lewis Carroll took up the new art form of photography under the influence of, uh, influence first of his uncle, Skeffington Ludwig. That, look at his name, Charles Ludwig Dodson, and he goes by Lewis Carroll, and later of his Oxford friend, Reinald Southey. He soon excelled at the art and became well-known gentleman photographer. And he see, and he seems to even had toyed with the idea of making a living out of it in his very early years. That's a lot of information that people don't know about Lewis Carroll. We only know, um, you know, of his Alice in Wonderland. And here's here's uh, these are all 
Albumin prints from wet collodion negatives, by the way. And here's Alice Little as a young child. Um, this was in the summer of 1858, Alice Little as the beggar maid. He calls it an albumin silver print from glass negative. It's 16.3 by 10.9 centimeters or six and seven sixteenths by four and five sixteenths inch, if you like the empirical kind of side. Uh, but there she is. She's the inspiration for the book. Um, but his his more, uh, we'll get to it here, but his, his uh, other portraiture, I do like this. What I want you to recognize is look at all the head space here in these portraits there it's incredible this looks like something out of loc.gov here in america library of congress as you look at all the wet collodion on loc.gov you'll see that they scan the negative in warts and all and they desaturated it so they you just have kind of a silver cool looking uh, image but i love to look at the entire plate right here's the corners um they weren't perfect. They, they had their artifacts and everything, but they were only concerned with that one sweet spot area. Here's Alice Little again at same same place, same time, summer of 58, same size of plate. Um, and, and they actually just say this is a wet, uh, this is a wet collodion glass plate negative. So they scanned it in and, and turned it into just a, a scan there just from the negative. And here we go again, uh, really, re you know, there again, there's a lot of headspace technically there. You can see that's an albumin print. Um, really odd here, the kind of the depth of field in the uh, with the doll and everything. Um, this is Ina Little. Uh, I think it's Alice's older sister, albumin print again. And then here, here, here where we get into the whole little children, right? The Edith, Mary Little, Ina Little, and Alice Little. There they all three are. So, and again, wet, wet clothing negative just scanned in. And there's the albumin print from it. So theoretically, that should reflect backwards as a negative, and it would. And then this is printed forward. So Alice is on the right. Um, here we go. This is interesting um, to have. It, it's kind of awkward because she doesn't really know what's going on here, right? I mean, really kind of interesting. And that laying couch, sitting couch, whatever that is. A little more theatrical here. Obviously, an albumin print again. Uh, Halman Tennyson, second Baron Tennyson. So now we're getting into this Lord Tennyson relatives and hi himself and the history there. Yeah, this is the National Portrait Gallery. So it goes through Alfred Tennyson's eldest son here. Uh, talks about, you can come back in and read this. We just want to look at the photographs. And here we go again, another scan plate. That's an interesting scene there. Kind of odd, strange. It's wonderful they've survived, though. Called Open Your Mouth and Shut Your Eyes. Edith, Mary Little, Ina Little, and Alice Little. July of 1860. So it's not like he, he only photographed these girls once. This was a span of, you know, several years actually um talks about the little family um there and then he talks about here at the end uh carol was enormously charmed by the little children uh, little not not small but their last name little children all of whom he photographed and nearly all of whom he made all of whom made their way into alice's adventures in wonderland and other related writings then we move into some other things. Here's the um, Rossetti family, again, an albumin print. I want to get down to some of his stronger portraits. Uh, that's that's Dante Gabriel Ros Rossetti. And here, look at this guy. This is one of my favorite here. I absolutely love this. Not only do I love that the entire print is shown here, which is awesome, um, but just the whole, that's in a powerful, em emotional kind of portrait to me. I mean, I don't know what that guy was thinking. Benjamin Woodward is his name. Uh, Albumin print, this is eight by six, late 1850s. I don't know what he's thinking, but Carol captured that. I mean, he, and notice the light. You know, these are Northlit studios. So this would actually be reversed as the negative, but look at the light on that. Um, just, just beautiful, just absolutely stunning light. Well made, you know, 170 years old kind of thing, just, just beautiful. 
Not so much here. Here's where we start having problems with albumin printing, mainly the egg whites breaking down and yellowing uh, some of the silver if they didn't wash them well. You know, that's John Ruskin, by the way, and he was very influential um, in back in the day. It looks like he might have had blue eyes too. I'm not sure there, but. And again, have you guys ever? Have you ever seen, and I know you have, but uh, kind of a kind of a uh, rhetorical question here. Have you ever seen portraits of people in the 19th century or even in the early 20th century sometimes, but mostly in the 19th century, where they have a little Jenny Lynn table drape, you know, they're sitting there and they have a book, they maybe, maybe have their hand on it or something. All of these were signs and clues back in the day that uh, the, those books meant that you were literate, that you could read and write. Um, there were uh, other telltale signs of objects in the photograph, not unlike the Vanitas, right? The Dutch Vanitas, the, the, the symbolism of death, the clock and the skull and, you know, time passing, all these kind of uh, what we call semiotics, um, saying, you know, semantics in verbiage, semiotics in visuals. But this is Lewis Carroll himself, obviously, he was a young man and obviously literate and could read. That's a uh, five and a half by four and five eighths or 140, 14 by 12 centimeter albumin print or negative, 1857. That's the year Scott Archer died. And there's Carol reading his book, a nice portrait, really lovely stuff, I think. Uh, here And here's the one that I selected. This is Alice, just, uh, you know, I have to, I as I was putting this show together, I realized when I was looking at this portrait and, and just kind of studying it, and he loved to use that chair, by the way. Um, this reminds me so much of Sally Mann's work with her children and some of those looks that, that are almost like, you know, exasperating. And, and look at her expression there. Like, what is she thinking? You know, and by this time, she knows what uh, the influence and he was obsessed. He was obsessed. Uh, Alice Little, June 25th, 1870. So this is uh, what she would have been 18, 19 years old, something like that there. She looks much older than that. But anyway, I wanted to share some. You guys can go back. I'll, I'll post this uh, link right now. You guys can go back in and take a look at some of that. If you're interested, I, you know, I always recommend people delve in to the history of this process the first players in this process, see what they were doing, see what kind of uh, influence they have, um, and, uh, and, and, and just enlighten yourself to the, their wonderful, um, wonderful photographers back in the day. Absolutely just amazing stuff. So I'll, I'll post this link here. Just let me pull this show back up and we'll continue on. I just wanted to share some of those. Well, and I'll, I'll pop some of these out once in a while, and you guys can take a look at them um on your own uh, i don't know what's up with my computer today man i need to yeah boom there and comments private chat i'll put it in the private chat as well boom and we'll probably look at some of uh margaret cameron's or rylander maybe we'll do rylander next week just brief you know five ten minutes just go through turn you on to some good good photographers turn you on to some interesting work um, I picked Lewis Carroll because everybody thinks of Alice in Wonderland. And I don't know if you even knew that Alice, the inspiration for Alice, was a wet collodion portrait, which is awesome. So let's look at some email. Here's Hank. Is Hank still here? Yeah, there's Hank. Um, let's talk about this, Hank. Uh, he asked me if I'd give my reaction to this. So Hank, if you remember, or Hank, we say Hank here. So Hank. Um, Hank. Uh, I don't know if you came in on a show. Something spurred this whole thing about um, cutting your exposures down a little bit so your images weren't as dark. Well, we played around a little bit, and I was telling Hank, um, uh, in my book, Chemical Pictures, I talk about this ad nauseum, overboard. I talk about the components in the developer and what each of them do. And let's Quickly recap, you've got the water, distilled or deionized water, which is the carrier. I have these little nicknames for them. So the carrier is the water. The ferrous sulfate is the reducer, right? That's what reduces your 
iodides and bromides to the metallic state of silver or close to it or, or completes it. And you've got the acid uh, as a restrainer that holds back development until your, all, your highlights and midtones and your shadows have enough time to come in. And then you have sometimes, most of the time, you have alcohol or a little bit of alcohol in your developer, and that's for flow or viscosity. So you don't start, the developer doesn't start and stop because once your bath gets saturated with solvents, that alcohol starts to fight the alcohol in the plate and, and you're in the, or the developer, the water in the developer, and you need that alcohol in the developer to float over. What we're talking about here is we're talking about restraining development or letting it go. So if you look at the Hank makes positives here, these are, um, I think they're, they're tintypes or, or, or glass ambro types. I'm not sure either way. Um, so we're talking about uh, taking some of the restrainer away out of his process. I don't know, you know, people write me all the time and say, what's wrong with this? And I'm, a lot of times I have to say, I don't know. I'm not in your studio. I'm not in your part of the world. I don't know the temperatures, the humidity. I don't know how the chemistry was mixed. I don't know. I don't know what you're doing, what light source you're using, what lens you're using. It's really a process of having to eliminate items in, in this process. Now, Having said that, Hank at 15 mils of acidic acid and 500 mils of water um, shouldn't be a problem unless the exposure is too, uh, if you're underexposing. Um, but 15 mils of acidic acid would be 30 mils in a normal developer at one liter, which would make it 3%. 3% restrainers, great, no problem. When we get into negatives and you really want to stretch that development out for a minute or a minute and a half, we go to 9%, 8 or 9% on the restrainer and negatives. So what does the restrainer do? It does exactly that. It holds back development. It prevents the precipitation. It re prevents the reduction of the iodides and bromides, the pure metallic state of silver. So basically, Hank cut out 5 milliliters of restrainer and these are the same shots. So on the right, you don't have as much restrainer. And on the left, you have more restrainer. It's a great example. And Hank, I wouldn't, eight seconds to come in and 20 seconds to complete. I would, you know, um, in my book, I talk ex about this a lot. In the temperature conditions, normal temperature conditions, 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, you should pour your developer on your plate and catch a little. I like to catch a little, catch some of that silver, push it back on there. I was going to read that out of Alfred's book today, but we'll get to it. And let that sit. By the time I put my developer cup down, I count one, two, three. My highlights should, should be in at three seconds. My midtones should be in at seven or eight, nine seconds. And the shadows should start forming around 12, 13, 14 seconds. And, and what I talk about shadows, anytime you're able to see the collar over here on her, on this mannequin here uh, versus here, once you start seeing this form up in the shadow area, anywhere in the shadow area, down here, anything you can see in detail, that's when you arrest development. So 15 to 20 seconds max if it's colder, um, maybe a little shorter when it's warmer, but 15 to 20 seconds. Eight seconds is quite a long time, unless it's cool in your dark room, to start seeing highlights of an image. But it's all good. It's it's not a it's not the end of the world. Um, a few seconds, as long as you're not fogging or veiling the plate, you're good to go. Hello, Jean. Um, cheers from France. Good deal. And and now Jot from India. Good to see you again as well. So. I appreciate Hank sharing this because this is a really important um, step in the process to understand. And again, I try to help people understand how the process works, right? Rather than just showing or demonstrating something, it doesn't really do much because there are so many variables. How does this compound affect that compound? What does temperature do? What does light do? What does you know, uh, relative humidity do? What do, what do all these things do? So 
it's a great thing. It's a, it's a great uh, way to begin your journey on understanding how you're producing those images. Very, very good stuff to, to get in tune with, as it were. Mr. Ketterman, good to see you. Welcome, welcome. I can't get everybody in here, but I, I'll try eventually. So having said that, um, any questions on any of that stuff? Anything. It doesn't even have to be related to this, but um, we can talk about Rylander photos. Any any technical questions? I mean, we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to. Uh, oh wow, good, good. We don't have to go in too deep. But if you if you think of something, stop me and let me know. Um, let me give you. I wanted to spend just a minute on this. <laughs> I know, recommended reading. What are you talking about, recommended reading? This is, and I, I'm, I'm going to give you the reasons why I'm recommending these books. Number one, you can, I think you can download Lanier's book, Jaron's book, The Ten Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts. And the second one is an older book called The Shallows by Nicholas Carr, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. This is over 10 years old. And why I'm recommending what collodion people read these books or, or photographers period really any artists period these two books will enlighten you or it did me to the fact of how this stuff and don't get me wrong i love technology i'm not bashing on technology i'm just trying to be real realistic about what's what what happens when we use um these technologies purely the way the inventors want us to use them the silicon valley guys right so when you read Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows, what he talks about, and again, this book is 10 years old or older, what he talks about is initially rewiring our brains. When you read um, Lanier's work, um, you'll quickly realize that this is engineered. This is, this is um, AI and, and technology engineering us, changing our behavior. And one of the things they really love to do through technology, because it's based on commerce, it's about us getting our credit cards out or our money out or our time that will lead eventually to, to spending money. It's all about creating revenue, getting eyeballs on things and creating revenue. And they don't want anybody hanging out or hanging around on things and trying to get in you know, get involved deeply with something. They want you to move on, move on. We talked about last week about the Instagram and images and what that does to our brain, spinning through Instagram photographs. This is an, the antithesis. This is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do in wet collodion work. And I don't care if you're a technical guy or a, a personal art guy or a commercial guy. Collodion, one of the reasons we're attracted to these processes, and after you read these books, you'll, I bet you you'll have a similar opinion. One of the reasons we're attracted to these books is, or, or this process is because it's the antithesis of what our world is encouraging us to do today. Have you found yourself not being able to read two or three paragraphs at a time, or you can't sit down with a book very long and read it and stay engaged with it? If you find yourself like that, you're probably spending too much time online. You're probably re-engineering your brain. Just, oh, oh, where's the next dopamine? They call them dopamine farms, right? They give you a little hit of dopamine in your brain that rewards you. Oh, a like, a like, oh, a heart, or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever the little symbols are. Um, and there's nothing inherently wrong about that or with that. But what becomes a problem is when you go down the rabbit hole. Again, Lewis Carroll, right? When you go down the rabbit hole and you can't get out of it, you can't read a paragraph, you can't understand or comprehend, you can't sit down with a book and read an entire book, you can't spend time on your own thinking about things and slowing down. These are all engineered, te technologically engineered behavioral change techniques that we don't even know that's happening to us. They're changing our behavior. They're making us buy things and want things that we don't need, uh, that we can't afford. It's all based in commerce. And the reason I bring it up here on a wet collodion photographic show is because it's the, the antithesis. That's probably or could be a reason why you're attracted to this process, because it throws everything back 
in the in, technologically speaking in the face of this AI and this behavior modification um, that we don't even know is happening to us when we're cruising social media and when we're doing all these things. There's a whole realm out there. I, I, I've looked into it in the last year, year and a half. Uh, capitalism surveillance about, you know, what they're doing through. And this isn't conspiracy theory. This, These are technical people writing algorithms and letting AI do its thing and changing our behavior through social media. And we're not even aware of it, right? To get us to buy things. That's it, right? To get us to spend our money. Not the end of the world. Not the, you know you know, things are going to blow up and go crazy just to get us to buy more crap, stuff that we don't need, stuff that we don't want. Keep us addicted to that. Keep hitting, pinging our dopamine farms with the likes and, oh, how many YouTube views and how many this and how many that. Doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. Um, exactly, Pablo. That's what capitalism is all about. And it's taken it to the new level, though, a new level where you sit and spin on social media and they're changing your behavior and you don't even know it. This stuff is seriously weird, seriously scary, and it's it's out there on the edge. And it changes the way we look at photographs. And that's really my point here. When you can't spend time looking at a photograph, thinking about a photograph, reading about a photograph, and all you want to do is click, cut it, you know, just spin through that stuff, that is rewiring your brain. That is taking your understanding. It starts with reading. I know it starts with reading. You'll read about this in the shallows. You'll read about it in Chris Hedges' work. It starts with getting away from the printed page, getting away from reading. These are all change, uh, uh, behavioral changes, and you'll see it manifest in your life. You'll see it. You'll see it show up as, "Whoa, I can't read that," or uh, "I tried to read this book," or you know. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Okay, Mark, Mark. Hey, Mark. Yeah, great recommendations here. I'm glad I brought this up. Mark says, watch a social dilemma documentary. If you guys have access to Netflix, or if you can, if you're, if you don't have Netflix, Google that social dilemma documentary. Exactly. That's I. I didn't even. In fact, Jaron is in there. The guy. This first author is in there. That's exactly right. Thanks for sharing that, Mark. And this TED talk relates to the idea of attention. Which TED Talk is it, Will? We'd love to see it. I think this is important for photographers and especially people who work in these old slow processes. You're, we have, I was going to say you, we, we have an uphill battle. We have an uphill battle in front of us. Part of it is engaging the audience and we can do that quickly with something different like wet collodion. The other part of it is getting to hang around if you have anything to say about it. And this is really difficult to get people to do now. Read a book. Oh, very good for you, Paul. Very good. That is, a, Paul says, I read a book a week, seven pages a day. Good discipline. You're fighting against that. Sort of, and, and again, I bring this up not to rant on technology. I bring it up because we are visual people. We're semiotic people. We look at symbolism and images and we love to make photographs and they mean something to us. And we can't dilute that in this high speed world of spitting out a billion images a day and expecting us to consume, accommodate and assimilate all that information. We can't do it. It's impossible. And it drives us crazy. Oh, well, says the social. OK, yeah, good. And then how craving attention makes you feel. Oh, look at that. Very good. Thank you, Will. Uh, how craving attention makes you less creative. Joseph Gordon Levitt. Look that one up. I I'll look that one up as well. I'll watch that for sure. I am fascinated about the way the world is changing, about my place in the world as a visual artist, about my place in the world as trying to tell stories and give a narrative and engage people with, with a story, a catalyst to have conversation. It's going to be very, very difficult to do. In, in, it might even, it's even difficult to do right now. I mean, the last, and again, I've been shut down on my business uh, for COVID since March. I haven't done any lectures or demos or workshops or anything. But before that, when I go out to the unis and the colleges, it was apparent, this attention problem, this like, let's move on. Let's, you know, we can't dwell on anything. Move on. Give me another dopamine hit. Give me something fascinating. Hit my brain. Hit my brain, right? Um, very, very important that we pay attention to this stuff as visual artists. 
and really as consumers too, right? We don't want to be manipulated like that. So, or I don't, I don't know. And I'm not saying I'm on social media. You know, I am right. I'm on social media. That may change eventually. Um, that may change. And I'm trying to mitigate these issues and trying to be aware of them. But I know in reality that um, I can't get out of it any any more than anyone else can. So, um, and I don't want to paint a huge broad brush here. I'm not saying every 18 year old or 25 year old can't pay attention. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying this dilemma is creeping into our lives and we, we it's like the frog in the pan being heated up, you know, Oh, you'll never know. Warmer, 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 and then it's boiling, right? It's a, it's a process of this. And as a visual artist, I think you should be aware of this stuff. And that's, I'll recommend a couple of books every week. I decided, why am I not doing this? I should recommend a couple of books every week. I'll try to anyway. So anyway, long rant. I'm sorry I didn't get to the, uh, to the, uh, the Alfred Brothers book. I promise you I will, though. I'll screenshot the pages. There's something with my this MacBook that doesn't like the new Adobe Reader and it freezes up and crashes. So, and I'll just do the screenshots and put them up next time. Tell me what you guys want to do. You want to, anybody have anything? Um, uh, that's all I have. Uh, Quinn. Please. May I suggest, uh, recommend some books? Yes, about the sure. topics that we discussed. Absolutely. Please do. Yeah, first of all, the Lewis Carroll, I was uh, obsessed with him. I read about seven or eight books uh, about him. Oh, great. There is one particular one, this one. Oops. This is by Whoa. Helmut Bernstein. Beautiful. That's Beautiful. the guy who discovered Lewis Carroll. I mean, until the time he discovered, nobody knew that he was a photographer as well, uh, besides being an author and a mathematics professor. He found a, a small album of him, and uh, that's how every, everything started. That's a very good book. This one is the uh, original, but there's a, a new uh, print as well. Yeah, can I jump in? Uh, you're so right. People don't know. He was a mathematics professor. He taught mathematics at Oxford, believe it or uh -huh. not. Yeah, in three different areas. It's very interesting. I mean, he's a mathematics professor, a scientist. Uh, he's a writer uh, and also a photographer. And he himself identified him more with photography than the other two, actually. It's in his diaries. Very true. Excellent point there, yes. Yeah. And, and that's so great. You've read so much about him because so few people know about his work. And I will say this, you bring up a great point. Um, my graduate degree is called a Master of Fine Arts here in America. We call it a Master of Fine Arts. It's what's called a terminal degree. So I'm terminally educated, right? So I can't, I can't get a doctorate degree in art. I, I mean, I could get one in art history, I guess, a PhD. But an MFA or a Master of Fine Arts is the highest you can go in the arts. One of the things about my master's degree and the particular program I chose to do is, uh, and it was accepted, of course, is an interdisciplinary art program, meaning that you get, and I've said this a lot on this show, you guys know this, you get so much more in your own personal creative work, just like Kareem just said about Lewis Carroll. He's diversified. He writes. He uh, teaches, he lectures on math. He's he's diversified. He, he, he gets a lot of influences from a lot of areas. It's probably why I like his work so much. If you can, the more, in, more inclusive you can be with other disciplines and ideas, philosophy and sculpture and painting and writing, I guarantee you the better artist you'll be. That's, that's what I wanted to say. That is wonderful. I didn't know yeah, you were- There's another one. This one is also very good, my second favorite. Uh, it's all photographs, photographs, but it discusses each photograph uh, like this one here. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah. Perfect, Perfect layout. And the could you give us one. one. Could, uh, Kareem, could you post those links by chance? Do you have a link? Yeah, yeah, I will. I, I definitely will. Appreciate I'll it. I'll find them. And... This is the first one that I read, actually. It's 
also a very yeah, good one. Yeah, look at look at there's Alice. There's mm -hmm. Alice. Yeah, nice. And also on all those books, there are different views about his relation with Alice. Yes. Uh, yeah. Some people find it kind of disturbing. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but uh, reading Helmut Gernsheim, you get a, a different perspective about that. It's very interesting. Um, Karim, you, you know, it's very interesting. And I said this when we were, we were looking at a couple of his photographs in there. Um, I didn't want to mention it because I don't like to disparage or, or cast dispersions on people that, that are, especially that are dead. But mm -hmm. again, in the 1980s, um, Sally Mann and Jock Sturgis here in America had some real problems, especially Jock Sturgis, with the FBI coming in and raiding his studio of, of child pornography. And Sally Mann got brushed up against that a little bit as well. And as I read Lewis Carroll, there were talk back in the day of his pedophilia, potential pedophilia, or wanting to be around children so much. So they do cast light. And unless you get into it, like Green saying, you're going to, you may interpret something that's incorrect about this person. Sorry. Yeah, but Helmut Gernsheim uh, clarifies all that. And yeah, it's yeah. Uh, very relieving. And the last one about the uh, other topic that you mentioned, this oh, is the Victorian oh. internet. It's about telegra uh, Telegraph. The, uh, when Ford? Telegraph first came, they had similar discussions that we are having now for the internet and social media. Oh. It's very interesting. That's awesome. I thought you yeah. were going to talk yeah. about the Morse code being Samuel Morris. Samuel Morris was one Morse of the first is also a photographer. Yeah. First daguerreotypist in America, 1849 mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah, awesome stuff. Thank you for sharing that. No, no please. problem. I'll uh, put the links please, in please. the chat. Thank you very much. That is yeah, awesome. No problem. See, this is this is the wonderful thing about gathering a group of people, sharing some information. And then we got somebody, Michael Jordan fan, and go over some things. You, got, you guys are getting information. Do you see that in the YouTube chat? We're, we're popular enough. Do you guys see that in the YouTube chat? I'm going to block that guy. Michael Jordan fans are the worst. <laughs> I don't know what that was all about, but very nice. Thank you for sharing that. That was wonderful. Um, there you go. Uh, he shared that up on the private chat, and I'll move it over to the YouTube. All right. That was that's good. I love it. Uh, I love it. There we go. So, yes, I have, um, I have, and always have had um, a, a a big push or a, a drive in me that wants to understand the context of anything I'm doing. Right? It's not just enough to see that in front of me. I need to know how it got here, how it works, why is this, why is that. I'm I'm a prodder and a poker. I love to experiment. I love to figure things out. But at the end. They all serve a purpose of some goal in mind, having some goal or some purpose in mind. So as you go through this work, and I can't encourage people enough to get books, read them, go online, read them. I want to I want to read that Victorian uh, one. That, that sounds fascinating. Um, uh, and I can see the arguments. Actually, I can see the arguments. But as you as you as you consume more about other artists, other ideas, other processes, and it influences your work, you will manifest that naturally. And, and it'll be more interesting to people, right? People want to know. People want to hear stories. We are born storytellers. That's what we do. We sit around and have coffee and talk, tell stories about how we caught this big fish or how we drove this many miles or this many kilometers or whatever it is. We sit around and we tell stories. That gives our life meaning, and that's what we need. And someday we'll talk about meaning in life versus meaning of life. No one knows the second one, but we, we have some pretty good ideas and theories on the first one. So, well, that's it, guys. Uh, oh, and that's, uh, yes, thank you very much for those. Um, I'm going to post them over here on this side, too. 
So if you guys want these, uh, boy, he, he had a nice resource there. I appreciate you sharing those. And uh, that looks just absolutely fascinating. But then again, I'm kind of a geek, you know. I, I like to geek out a little bit. I, I don't mind a, a geeky thing going on here or there. So, anywho, um, are we back up here? Um, sorry about the technical difficulties today, but uh, we are going to uh, make adjustments. Now I know that I don't have. Now I know that I don't have the ability to run uh, that PDF. Um, program or Adobe Acrobat and this MacBook. I'll do the screenshots. We'll go over the um, Alfred Brothers content next week. I'll make that central to our program. Is there anything else, ladies and gentlemen? We want to open this up to anybody that wants to. Not the uh, not the uh, the basketball guy. He was. I don't know what he was trying to do. But anybody else? Well, I want to say thank you again. And I appreciate you. Um, uh, oh, Jan says, after I technically master the wet plate, I will start study art photography from 45, 1845 to 1920 at university. Good for you. Are, are you I, I, would, I would assume you're being legitimate about that, Jan. I don't think it's a joke. Yeah, great. That's, that's awesome. Good for you. We'll, we'll be here to support you and cheer you on. You can come in here and share some information about what you learned. We're, we can always learn more, right? We, we can always take in more. We can always learn more. And, you know, part of that is technical, right? In this process, we can learn how much of this and how much of that and to do this and to do that. What's really difficult to teach or to get is how we employ that or put that into our lives, in our work specifically, right? How do we take all this great technical information? And that's what it sounds like Jan's doing. How do we take all this great technical information and then apply it to something meaningful, right? Technical information is great, but it, it's only the tool to get you to where you're going, right? It's the car or the fuel to get you to your destination. It's not the car or the fuel that's the destination. That's the tool to get you there. So it's really important that we stay open and we stay actively learning. I call it lifelong learning, of course. And uh, and we're, we should always be always open to that. I, I surely am. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you have a great, wonderful weekend. Stay safe. Stay away from all the nasty stuff in the world. And I hope to see you here next Saturday. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.